Hello, welcome to the principles of dynamic causal modeling lecture. The aim of this lecture is to lay down a concise groundwork for understanding DCM, setting the stage for our forthcoming DCM lectures on this topic later today. DCM was developed by Professor Carl Briston just over two decades ago to infer biological causes of neuroimaging data. Unlike other techniques, such as a structural connectivity analysis, which is used to explore the presence of axonal connection between brain regions, and functional connectivity analysis, which entails measuring statistical dependencies between different sources, DCM, also known as effective connectivity analysis, stands out as a hypothesis testing technology. As we will see later in this lecture, DCM can be used to specify, infer, and compare quality of several hypotheses associated with a given neuroimaging data and select the likely one to elucidate causal influence between brain regions. In this lecture, we will provide a succinct introduction about the fundamental principles of the DCM. We will explain four key topics about crucial aspects of the DCM. Firstly, we will explain the DCM estimation procedure, emphasizing the significance of model evidence for translational neuroscience. Next, we will unpack assumption of DCM about underlying generators of neuroimaging data features. Moving to the third part, we will navigate through the intricacies of biological models. And in section four, we will discuss prior and their importance in the DCM. And after giving an illustrative example, we will explain multimodal DCM. Model inference in DCM includes optimizing free energy with respect to unknown parameters of the model using a variational Bayesian technology to estimate either synaptic physiology or effective connectivity from our empirical data. There are two subtle yet critical aspects to employing free energy for the inference. Firstly, it effectively prevents overfitting. Secondly, free energy facilitates comparing different hypotheses about the underlying generators of the data through Bayesian model comparison. The outcome of a typical DCM includes posterior estimates of unknown effective connectivity or synaptic physiology, model prediction versus observed data, which can give us a clue about how accurate our model can capture underlying dynamics of our data, and model evidence, which, as I mentioned, is useful to comparing uh, different hypotheses. Free energy, also known as evidence lower bound, of a given model is a numeric equal to model accuracy minus model complexity. DCM optimized the free energy with respect to unknown model parameters to infer parameters that accurately replicate the data and they are not too complex. This effectively decreases the chance of overfitting in the DCM. We shall establish an intuitive understanding of model complexity through an illustrative example and explore how free energy aids in finding an optimal solution. Consider a scenario where we aim to model the behavior of a system that generates a green line using polynomial functions. First, we sample from the curve and adding no some noise to it, and consider the ensuing data points as observation data, similar to what we typically observe as a EG, MEG recording, and ask what causing this data. Through this example, our aim is to explain as we increase the complexity of our model, we introduce more parameters and 
intercorrelation amongst them. Such complexity often leads to better fit to the training data, but may result in overfitting where the model performed poorly on unseen data due, due to its excessive focus on capturing noise. By using free energy, we can strike a balance between model complexity and accuracy. Free energy acts as a regularization term during the model optimization, penalizing overly complex models and favoring those that explain the data effectively while remaining parsimonious. In essence, free energy guides us toward an optimal solution by encouraging models that strike the right balance between complexity and generalization, thereby enhancing our ability to make accurate prediction on unseen data. In this slide, we explore the prediction of different polynomial of degree 1, 3, 7, and 11. Comparing the results show that as we increase the degree of the polynomials, in other words, our model complexity, we can pass through more observation red dots, where in polynomial of degree 11, for example, we pass many points. Comparing the results, showing that the accuracy of the polynomial of degree 1 is not good at all, the accuracy of polynomial degree 3 is acceptable, but it cannot pass through all of the points. However, as we see at the end of the green line, the direction of the evolution of both prediction of the model and the, the actual system is quite aligned. In opposite, in the polynomial of degree 11, we pass so many points, but the, green, the direction of the green line at the end is upward, whereas in the, the, the direction of the predicted prediction of our model is downward. So that basically speaks to the fact that we need to focus on finding a right balance between our accuracy and complexity when we, we are modeling data. In the ECM, after inferring a model, we obtain the free energy score representing the trade-off between model accuracy and complexity. This score serves as a measure of the model goodness or the quality of the model to the empirical data. To compare different models, we utilize the base factor, which is essentially the ratio of evidence provided by the data under two different hypotheses or two different models. For example, polynomial of degree 3 and polynomial of degree 11 here. By comparing free energy scores using the base factor, we can determine which hypothesis is more likely given the observed data. For instance, here we can test the polynomial of degree 3 better capture the underlying cause of the data compared to polynomial of degree 11. Therefore, this can be as a parsimonious explanation of our data. To better explain the importance of balancing between accuracy and complexity of a model, we explain the procedure that Hodgson and Huxley follow to establish their seminal model. Hodgson and Huxley model quantitatively describe the behavior of different ion channels like potassium, calcium, etc., and their contribution to the generation and propagation of action potentials in neurons. However, they first proposed a linear model, a linear circuit model like what we see here, as the generator model of the neuron's behavior. However, soon they realized that such linear model couldn't fully capture essential features of their experiment. As a result, they introduce a nonlinear relation between conductances and the fraction of open channels using series of polynomial, exponentials, and other functions. Interestingly, in selecting the power of 
the mononomials that they introduced, power of one, two, three, four, they carefully balanced the complexity and accuracy, resulting in their elegant and highly useful model that remains relevant today. In DCM, as I explained, we followed the same kind of procedure and tried to find such a balance between complexity and accuracy for explaining the empirical data by using free energy as the cost function for finding the model parameters. The second topic in this lecture, we will discuss data features in DCM. That is to say how different data features that we have access to, like ERP, CSC, mixed data features can be modeled using DCM. In the earlier lectures, we were introduced to several data features associated with EEG and MEG data, including evoked response in old ball paradigms, resting state oscillations, and their frequency domain characteristics, induced time frequency responses, and mixed neuroimaging data features such as fMRI and MEG. We learned to apply general linear model to study the effect of interest associated with these data features. In the context of dynamic causal modeling, our principal question is, what can be the primary underlying biogenerators of these data features? The key DCM principle in modeling different data features is that neuronal dynamics are at a stable equilibrium in the absence of any input. Different types of input induce time or frequency domain data features. For example, experimental inputs like visual or auditory stimuli lead to event-related potentials. Random neuronal fluctuations induce oscillation around the neuronal equilibrium. And these fluctuations about the mean evoke response can generate induced responses. In DCM for ERP, resting states, or induced response, we aim to incorporate these key mechanisms to facilitate the inversion of biological models, which will be the focus of discussion in the upcoming lectures. The third core part of our DCM lecture is about biological generative models of our neuroimaging data. This is one of the core part of this lecture and will be used in the subsequent lectures when we further explain DCM for ERP and DCM for CSC and so on. To link EEG and MEG data to their biological origin, we shall start explaining laminar structure and the activity of cortical column that are loosely captured by electrodes. Historically, Hubel and Wiesel presented different directional arrows to a cat while they simultaneously recorded the activity of the cat's visual cortex. They observed that each orientation is associated with synchronized neuronal firing in specific locations, known as cortical column, that are collectively detected by electrodes. The anatomical structure of cortical columns can be divided into three principal layers, known as supragranule, granule, and infragranule layers, each hosting a specific type of cells. Therefore, the most parsimonious model of EEG and MEG involves the interactions between few neuronal populations associated with these layers. The ensuing model are called mesoscale or neural mass model in computational neuroscience community. So let's explain the structure of neural mass model or mesoscale model from a historical point of view. Wilson and Coven pointering mesoscale, mesoscale model that include excitatory and inhibitory populations 
to model EEG dynamics half a century ago. Excitatory populations increase the likelihood of activation of neighboring neurons, while inhibitory populations have the opposite effect. This model could replicate damp oscillatory behavior in response to short duration inputs, linking this phenomena to the generation of evoked potentials, and mimicking limit cycle phenomena in EEG data in response to constant firing input. This work perhaps is recognized as the foundation of modern computational neuroscience, aiming to better understand the functional significance of cortical complexity. Another significant contribution came from Lopez de Silva about the importance of random neuronal fluctuations in the generation of resting state data and the specific role of different anatomical connections in the genesis of alpha rhythm. Freeman work particularly led to introducing a loop linear model for synaptic transmission of a typical neuronal population. Lastly, Janssen and Reed neural mass model in 1994 brought together all these advancements and developed a model that can simulate different forms of brain activity from noisy alpha rhythm to spike and wave discharges and inspired many research to date. We shall explain a structure of interconnected neural mass models comprising several neuronal populations represented by triangle, circle, and so on, their intrinsic connections and extrinsic connections. We will start by unpacking the model of uh, a neuronal population, followed by a review of various within and between region connections. Now, we explain a model for a typical neuronal population in neural mass model. Each population in neural mass model represent the collective activity of neurons in a specific layer of the cortex. A model governing the dynamics of each population in neural mass models involve two operations, firing rate to potential conversion and potential to firing rate conversion. The first operation is given by a linear system with an impulse response H of T. Essentially, this means that for, a, for an incoming spike with an amplitude of one, the response of the population has the shape of H of T. For the collection of firing, whether they are intrinsic, extrinsic, or experimental, the response of the population is a weighted sum of many h's shifted in time by the input, which is represented in a compact form by the convolution operator. We will unpack this later in the lecture. The second conversion is potential to firing rate, is represented by a sigmoid function and introduced by Wilson and Coven. Essentially, it states that for small membrane potentials, firing rates are small. And as the potential increases, the firing increases, but eventually saturates, similar to sigmoid transformation. Now, let's further unpack the first conversion operation, which is mean firing rate to postsynaptic potential conversion denotes U as the incoming firing to the population, which is approximated to many individual spikes with different amplitude at different points in time. When a spikes arrive at a specific time, the, the neuronal population generate an scaled version of H of T shifted to the time of the spikes. By summing up all of these responses, we obtain a linear approximation of the overall response of neural population to several input. Essentially, this is the scale sum of the shifted version of H of T defined as a convolution integral. For those unfamiliar with the convolution, 
it is essentially a weighted sum of several shifted version of H. It is important to note that this represents the collective response of several neurons situated in the laminate of a cortical column and empirically established by Freeman. The mean potential to firing rate conversion can be motivated both empirically and mathematically. From an empirical standpoint, for a small membrane potential, firing rates are small. As the potential increases, firing rates increase, but eventually it saturates. This phenomena conveniently align with the sigmoid shape transformation. From a mathematical standpoint, let's assume that there are many neurons of the same type are situated in a layer of a cortical column. These neurons either fire or do not fire, with firing depend upon depolarization potential reaching a threshold. Given variability in the neuronal activation thresholds, which are similar but not identical, this can be modeled via a Gaussian distribution function. Now, for incoming potential, a fraction of these neurons may be activated, resulting in a distribution of thresholds that in turn activates some neurons. Summing all firings of all neurons naturally give rise to cumulative distribution, which is represented by a sigmoid transformation. This is the second approach to find this conversion operation. Motivated by realistic structure of a cortical column, in this lecture we will explain canonical neural mass model commonly employed in predictive coding and a study of neurological conditions in recent years. This model encompasses superficial and deep pyramidal cells representing the collective dynamics of neurons in superficial and deep layer of the cortical column, respectively. It also includes spiny stellate ex excitatory cells in layer four of the co cortical column and an inhibitory interneural population serving as a loop model of interneurons within the cortical column. These populations are interconnected via intrinsic excitatory, represented by black dot, or inhibitory, represented by green line connections, inspired by anatomical connections observed in the brain. There are also top-down and bottom-up extrinsic connections that interconnect cortical columns with each other. Two types of connect extrinsic connections, forward and backward, can connect two or more cortical areas to, to each other. Forward connections involve, pro involve the projection of firing rates from superficial pyramidal cells to a spiny stellate and deep layers of the higher level of a brain hierarchy. And backward connection, on the other hand, project activities of deep pyramidal cells back to inhibitory and superficial layer of a lower anatomical region. External input primarily target spiny stellate cells and often originate from the thalamus. That complete the explanation of the extrinsic connections in the neural mass model. The local field potential generated by a cortical column is a result of activity of superficial layer plus weighted sum of the activity of the deep layer pyramidal cells and excitatory cells. It is important to note that in modeling ECOG or EEG data, we infer the contribution of deep pyramidal cells and excitatory cells cells, while the activity of superficial cells contribute to the local field potential with certainty. Furthermore, the resulting summed activity need to be scaled by L, which can be either sensor gain or forward head model 
which can be ECD, IMG, or LFP, to generate EEG, MEG data. In SPM12, there are several variations of neuronal models, known as convolution-type neural mass models. These models are termed convolution type because the synaptic impulse response H of T, as we explained, maintain a fixed shape regardless of input firing rates. Another type of model in SPM12 is called conductance-based models, uh, formulated based upon the Maurice Lacasse simplified Hutchinson Huxley model. These models incorporate detailed physiology where the dynamics of the membrane potential includes several ion currents, such as ampere, NMDA, and GABA, and so on. The rate for the changes of the conductance here is scaled by the incoming firing rates to the population, meaning that the presynaptic input or inputs directly influence synaptic responses in the target population. This represents a departure from the fixed shape impulse response, as we explained in the convolution neural mass model. And as you see, this model includes detailed physiology, so it can be very useful to study neurological conditions and so on. There are several types of conductance-based model available in SPM12 software, as you can see here. In the conductance-based model, presynaptic input directly influence synaptic mechanism, and they include detailed physiology, as we described. As a fourth topic, we cover prior and their importance in the DCM. So DCM is roughly is a Bayesian inversion of dynamical system distributed on a graph and therefore requires some prior information for the inference. I should also say that most of our research recently are mostly focused on optimizing prior for the DCM. And this is one of the key um, factors in successing our translational modeling practice. Because dynamic causal modeling relies on Bayesian inversion, specifying well-defined prior is crucial. Our primary consideration for modeling event-related potential or resting state is that in the absence of any input, we settled at a stable equilibrium. The prior for the parameter in the DCM are defined such that our model is at a stable equilibrium effectively over the network that we define to satisfy this condition. Next, the second consideration is that we must acknowledge that parameterization of a model has a significant impact on the model complexity and consequently model evidence. Therefore, several approaches have been developed, in particular by Klasse Stefan, over the years to reduce the complexity of the posterior estimates of the parameter. One such approach is to seek parameterization for which we expect the least complexity of the model in terms of posterior correlation between the parameter. In general, we avoid collinear parameters that cannot be distangled and affect our, the interpretability of our model. Finally, the definition of the prior in DCM for EEG allows us to add some sense of geometry and interpretability to our model. As I explained earlier, in our generative model, we assume that for instance, superficial pyramidal cells certainly contribute to the local field potential. This prior effectively embed a, sense, a sensible biological geometry into our model. Having learned all of the aspects of uh, DCM and the principle of the DCM, now it's time to 
give an example of how we can specify and invert a biological model from neuroimaging data. Let's see an example of real experiment. We would like to model ERP that elicit from a mismatch negativity with agency paradigm. Here we have two deviant and two standard responses for a subject. And we recorded the responses using MEG and fMRI device. We leverage st statistical analysis of fMRI to learn about which regions in the brain are activated in response to our paradigm. These are considered as prior information about the location of activated neuronal sources, which we would like to, to model using our MEG data. In our approach, we take the coordinates of active regions and allocate neural mass model to each region. These neural mass model are then connected via forward and backward connections. The red dot line in the network represent connection that are defined to be changed for modeling deviant condition while retaining a standard response. This better known as condition specific parameters that are commonly represented by B matrix in the BCM. Here we see the activity map associated with one standard and one deviant response of our subject. Our aim is to use DCM to infer neuronal parameters that generate a standard response or otherwise called baseline condition. And then using condition specific parameters, which is embedded in the DCM, to model other conditions or deviant response with respects to the baseline condition. And this is how we explain the baseline in comparison with the deviant response. After executing the DCM, we can generate the observed versus predicted response in the sensor space, as we can see here. The DCM can well capture the essence of the dynamics of the real data in this experiment. Given the estimated parameters from the DCM, we can create prediction of the model and see the response of a population within the neural mass model to each stimulation. For example, here for one population, we show the response to two types of standard and two types of deviant stimuli. As a final topic in this lecture, we will explain multimodal dynamic causal modeling. Our key consideration is how can we integrate different modalities to either learn something new about the brain function or facilitate reaching better model evidence for given EEG or MEG data. First, we consider integration of MEG and fMRI data as an example of integrating two non-invasive functional neuroimaging modalities to learn about neurovascular coupling through hypothesis testing, which can be useful to study aging and neurological conditions where neurovascular coupling are affected. Next, we will explore integration of magnetic resonance spectroscopy information as prior for synaptic parameters within the DCM for resting state MEG data aiming to achieve higher fidelity of the models. In other words, achieving better model evidence through this multimodal integration of a structural and functional neuroimaging data. As we observed so far, fMRI can provide prior information for active neuronal sources in the DCM for MEG. However, 
the integration of fMRI and MEG can offer much more insight into the brain function. Let's consider a scenario where a stimulus triggers neuronal responses. Upon the responses, neurons demand energy through a biological breach known as neurovascular coupling, which activate hemodynamic response unit of the brain. Neurovascular coupling facilitate alteration in the blood flow, which is accompanied by changes in the volume and deoxyhemoglobin level in the vascular unit. These collectively give rise to bold response, which is captured by the fMRI machine. With this information, our interests lie in testing different hypotheses about the origin of the bold, which has been an outstanding question for years and is very useful for understanding neurological conditions such as aging and Alzheimer's disease. It is worth mentioning that all the concepts we are discussed today are available through the MVC2 toolbox in the SPM12. Now, let's provide an overview of how we perform multimodal DCM before delving into the details. We start by a statistical analysis of fMRI data and identify active regions in the brain. Using this information, we specify a neural, neuronal network and perform DCM for MEG, as explained earlier. Given the inferred parameters from the DCM for MEG, we then generate a neuronal responses to each stimulation. These neural responses are concatenated over the onset of the fMRI paradigm and creating a long time series, which we refer to as neuronal drive function. All of these time series are then combined through a model of a neurovascular coupling unit, which are then excite the hemodynamics part of the model and will be inferred by the DCM for fMRI. The first step in generating the neuronal drive function involves generating pre and post synaptic responses of each population in each source for each experimental condition using the inferred parameter from DCM for MEG. As you can see here, we have four conditions and therefore we have four responses associated with each condition for each population. Next, we then replicate the ensuing neuronal responses over the onset of the fMRI paradigm and the resulting input are fed into the neurovascular unit, as we explained. Here is an, here is an illustration of the neuronal drive function of the population I in the J source. We replicate each neural response over the onset in the fMRI paradigm and then sum them to get a single time series that contribute to the bold signal. Note that we do this procedure for all population in all of the sources. Now, we have to specify different hypotheses about the functional neurovascular unit. All of these hypotheses are established as an option in the NVC toolbox, as I explained earlier. For instance, we can define a factorial design by considering question one, whether neurovascular coupling is excited by pre versus postsynaptic potential neuronal drive, whether distal neuronal sources exert changes in the regional bold response, and so on. Next, we perform DCM for fMRI and collate the evidence associated with these models or hypotheses and compare.
compare them using Bayesian model comparison. Finally, we can perform Bayesian model comparison to determine which hypothesis is more likely. In this research, the most likely neurovascular coupling mechanism that induce bold response receive instantaneous local presynaptic neuronal activity with region-specific parameterization. And here are the parameters associated with neurovascular coupling over different regions. Now let's discuss the integration of a structural imaging with functional neuroimaging data. In this kind of multimodal DCM, a structural imaging provides us with information about anatomy, neurochemistry, ion concentration, and so on in particular part of the brain. We expect that this additional information will help DCM for MEG to achieve better model evidence resulting in higher fidelity model. So here we explain how to integrate magnetic resonance spectroscopy information with the DCM for MEG to reach higher fidelity model. We know that neurotransmitter concentration controls synaptic activity in the brain, and the synaptic activities in the brain and the connections give rise to uh, MEG data and captured by the MEG data. Magnetic resonance spectroscopy provide information about the concentration of different neurotransmitters in a localized part of the brain, for example, glutamate, GABA, and so on. Therefore, one could ask how to incorporate this information into the DCM for MEG to arrive better evidence for a given MEG data set compared to DCM when only MEG data is considered. Here we aim to test how MRS data can provide prior for different synaptic connections in the DCM in order to reach better model evidence. Our hypothesis is that incorporating MRS data or its transformed version indeed can improve model evidence in the DCM for MEG by placing prior constraint for certain synaptic connections in the DCM, which we need to specify. To answer which synaptic connection should be influenced by the MRS data and how, we gather a cohort of resting state MEG data together with their MRS data, and we systematically consider the MRS data as prior for different synaptic connections and measure its evidence. By comparing the model evidence associated with each hypothesis or each transform, if you like, we verify that a transformed version of MRS GABA can place a prior constraint on self-inhibition connections in our model. The tool that we use for our hypothesis testing is called group DCM or second level analysis, which we will be introduced in the later lectures. But all we have done is just changing prior and record its effect in terms of model evidence and comparing models using Bayesian model comparison. Here, a sigmoid transformation of our MRS GABA places a constraint on the self connections in our model. And this gives us the highest model evidence for the multimodal DCM.